right? All set. So the last talk, oh, sorry, the last paper is written by Pratyai Mukherjee and Daniel Wicks, and Daniel is giving the talk. All right, thank you. So um, I'm going to tell you about multi-key fully homomorphic encryption and uh, an application of it to two-round multi-party computation. So uh, probably most of you have already heard or know what fully homomorphic encryption is, but just a very brief uh, review. So um, uh, we have some party that has a, a value x, and uh, fully homomorphic encryption lets you encrypt this value x just like you would with a standard encryption scheme, so you can choose a public key secret key, encrypt x, and send this ciphertext over to, let's say, the cloud. And now you want the cloud to do some computation for you over the encrypted data, and uh, fully homomorphic encryption enables this, so the cloud can homomorphically compute any function f uh, over the data by doing some corresponding homomorphic operation on the ciphertext and output some ciphertext C star, which decrypts to f of x. So this is fully homomorphic encryption, or FHE for short. Multi-key FHE is just an analog of this to the setting with multiple parties. So here we have n parties that have inputs x1 up to xn, and they're going to choose independent public key see individually. They're going to choose independent public key secret keys. They're not going to coordinate with each other. And each party is just going to encrypt its value xi under its own public key and send these n ciphertext to the cloud. Yet we still want the cloud to be able to compute on these ciphertext even though they're encrypted by different parties under different keys. So there should still be some homomorphic procedure that allows the cloud to take these ciphertext and uh, evaluate it, evaluate an function f on them, and compute some ciphertext c star, such that c star decrypts to f of x. Okay, but under which key does it encrypt to f of x? And if you start thinking about it, it shouldn't decrypt under any individual secret key of any one of these parties, because if it did, it would mean that that party is learning information about the inputs of other parties which are encrypted under different keys. It shouldn't learn anything about that. Instead, what we want here is that if all the parties get together, pool their secret keys, there should be some way for them to decrypt the ciphertext and learn f of x. Actually, we want something a little more here. We want to make sure that there's some nice distributed way of doing this decryption where the parties don't have to reveal the secret keys to each other. Rather, each party does some partial, compute some partial decryption of the ciphertext, they combine them, and they get out f of x. So we want to be able to do this decryption in a distributed manner. So a little bit of background on this problem, multi-key FHE, it was originally proposed by Lopez, Altromer, and Vaikantanathan, and they gave a construction based on the n-true assumption, this is something to do with ID lattices, um, and they didn't have a nice way of doing the distributed decryption. So really the parties just had to come together and pull all their secret keys to decrypt. Last year at Crypto, there was a really nice uh, uh, construction from the learning with errors assumption that had a really good idea in there, but it was a very complicated construction. Essentially, the only way to understand it was just follow like a couple of pages of equations that really wasn't a nice framework for understanding what's, what's going on here. And they didn't discuss um, how to do distributed decryption. So what I'm gonna tell you about uh, in this talk is uh, first, I'm gonna show you a really simplified construction uh, based on the learning with errors assumption. It's real an adaptation of the GSW, Gentry Sahai Waters 13 FHE scheme. And uh, there's real a nice framework for understanding this construction. I think it's significantly simpler than uh, what was done in the previous work. And moreover, there's a really nice one round distributed decryption procedure for this construction. And this gives you an important application to multi-party computation. So let me tell you now uh, about this application. So first of all, what is multi-party computation? We have some parties, they have inputs, x1, x2, x3. They want to compute some function f over these inputs. They want to do this by running a protocol together in such a way that you have correctness, every party gets the output, and security. Nothing else about the inputs is revealed. And I'm thinking arbitrary number of corruptions um, in the setting. Okay, so uh, with multi-key FHE, we get a really simple two-round protocol for doing multi-party computation. What's the protocol? Each party just chooses its own public key secret key pair, uses the public key to encrypt its input x, xi, and just broadcasts the ciphertext. At the end of this first round, all the parties see all the ciphertext, and they can, each party can just run this uh, uh, homomorphic evaluation procedure and get a ciphertext C star, which encrypts the output of the computation under all the public keys. And now, in the second round, the parties can just run a distributed decryption procedure to decrypt the ciphertext and get out the answer. 
get the output. So um, this is the first actually, uh, oh, so uh, this protocol is secure against uh, semi-honest corruptions. If you want to get malicious security, you have to add non-interactive zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it's actually the first two-round multi-party computation protocol, uh, at least in the common random string model, that you can prove secure under a nice assumption like LWE. The previous that we only knew how to do this from indistinguishability obfuscation. Okay, so um, let me tell you now about how to actually construct this multi-key FHE. It's a good tool, lets us do MPC, how do we actually get it? And so I'm gonna tell you, um, first I'm gonna start out by telling you about the Gentry Sahai Waters fully homomorphic encryption schemes from LW, and then we'll see how to add a few tricks to make to convert that into multi-key FHE. So here we have to actually roll up our sleeves and do a little math, so we're gonna start with the learning with errors assumption, uh, which is the assumption these schemes are based on. And essentially this assumption says that random noisy linear equations are indistinguishable from uniform. A little more uh, precisely, we're gonna take uh, a uniformly random n by m matrix, so think of it as a path, uh, path matrix B over some, um, some group ZQ. And we're gonna take a random linear combination of the rows of B and add a little error. So we're gonna perturb each, each, each entry here by some small error and get out this vector little b and we're just gonna put these two things together. Now this matrix over here is statistically far from uniform. A uniformly random matrix, it's unlikely that the last row would be close to a linear combination of the previous rows. But the LW assumption says that nevertheless, computationally you cannot distinguish it from a uniformly random matrix. So this is the LW assumption. And it's uh, as hard as approximated as the shortest vector in worst case lattices. So uh, let's now go to the fully homomorphic encryption scheme. So uh, in the FHE scheme, the public key is just gonna be exactly this matrix that you saw on the last slide, this LW matrix. I'm gonna call this whole matrix A, okay. Um, and the secret key is gonna be a vector T, which is just negative S, S is the linear combination, and a one added at the end. And the main property to remember is that if you take T times A, you just get this error vector E, so you get something that's close to zero. I'm gonna use this notation to hide small things. Okay, so T times A is something that's close to zero. Main thing to remember. What about encryption? So encryption works like this. To encrypt a bit X under this public key A, I'm gonna take A times R, where R is a square matrix with just zero, one entries. So sh all entries are short, just zeros and ones. And I'm gonna add the bit X times G, where G is some public matrix. It's a fixed matrix. I'll show you what it is in a second. Uh, I'll call it a gadget matrix. Okay, I'll tell you what it is. You don't need to know for now. And the main property of the ciphertext is that if you take the secret key T times C, well, I told you T times A was short, R is short, so TAR is all short, you get something close to XTG. Okay, so those are the two things to remember. T times A is small, and T times C is close to XTG. So uh, I'll say, I'll th you can think of a ciphertext C as being good encryption of a bit X under a key T if this property holds. This is what it means to have an encryption of X. Okay, uh, oh, and uh, I should say that this uh, property also lets you decrypt by just taking T times C and seeing if, if the bit X is zero, you get something close to zero. If it's one, you get something that's large. So you can uh, decrypt, figure out whether the bit is zero or one. The security is actually really simple. So uh, first of all, I can use the LW, so this is the public key, there's an encryption of X. I can use the LW assumption to say that this looks indistinguishable from, but I can just replace the matrix A by uniform matrix. And now uh, I can use the leftover hash lemma to say that the uniform matrix times R looks actually like another independent uniformly random value. So that's the whole proof of security. What about doing the homomorphic evaluation? So I'm gonna show you how to take two ciphertexts that encrypt some bits x1 and x2, so again, that means that this property holds, and operate on them to get a ciphertext that encrypts x1 plus x2 and x1 times x2. And if I can do that, I can evaluate any circuit I want. So addition is really easy. I'm just gonna add the ciphertext. And you can see that uh, the same property now holds. So T times this new ciphertext is just X1 plus X2 times TG. So I got an encryption of X1 plus X2. What about multiplication? Well, I'd like to multiply the ciphertext, but they're sort of not the right dimensions. They're not square, I can't really do that. So here I'm gonna have to tell you what this gadget matrix G is, and so we're gonna use some properties of it. 
So um, actually, I don't really need to tell you what the gadget matrix is. I just need to tell you a property of it. So uh, G is some, some matrix such that there's an efficiently computable function G inverse, such that G times G inverse of Y for any Y is just Y. Okay, so if you think of this equation, G times X equals Y, so there's many solutions X to this equation. G inverse of, of Y just gives you one of these solutions, and in particular, it gives you a solution which has short entries, just zeros and ones. Such a solution exists, and, and in fact, you can find it efficiently. So G inverse is an abuse of notation. It's not a matrix inverse. It's a function, but it sort of acts like a matrix inverse because G times G inverse of Y is just Y. Okay, and uh, here's the implementation. So the matrix G is this powers of two matrix, and the G inverse function is just bit decomposition. I'm going to take the elements mod Q and just write them down in their bit notation. That's the whole idea. So now that I have that, Here's how to do multiplication. I'm just going to take the ciphertext C1 times G inverse of C2. And if you look at what happens is, if, uh, if I take T times this new ciphertext, I get T times C1, which is, close to, which is X1 TG plus some error, times G inverse of C2. E and G inverse of C2 are both short, so this sort of just becomes some short thing. I can ignore that. And G and G inverse C2 cancels out, so I get X1 T times C2, and now T times C2 is close to X2 TG. Okay, so by doing this, I get a ciphertext that encrypts the product of the bits. That's it. That's the whole, so this is, uh, you now saw how to do fully homomorphic encryption. That's the whole scheme. Um, the noise grows as I do homomorphic evaluation, so the error sort of in the ciphertext gets bigger and bigger as I'm computing a circuit. Um, that's okay. And if you don't like it, you can fix it with bootstrap. You can also get rid of it with bootstrapping. Okay. So now let's see how to extend, so that's fully homomorphic encryption. Now let's take it and see how to extend it to the multi-key setting. So uh, in this scenario now, we have many party, n parties with different public key secret keys. Each party has, let's say, secret key ti. And let me call um, something the expanded secret key as just being the concatenation of these n secret keys. So just a bigger vector that just concatenates all of them. And my goal will be to take a ciphertext belonging to, to an individual party I and somehow expand it into a multi-key ciphertext which encrypts the same message but under this expanded key. So I want to take an individual party ciphertext C which satisfies this equation, encrypt some X under the secret key TI and create a bigger ciphertext, I'll call it C hat, which satisfies the same equation but with respect to this expanded key. And everything grows, also the gadget matrix here grows, just like a bunch of gadget matrices uh, uh, combined together. Now, if I can do this, then I can just expand every, every party ciphertext, get them all to be ciphertext under this expanded key, under the same key, and then do the homomorphic operations just like I did before on the expanded ciphertext. So then I'm done. And then I can decrypt it with this expanded key. Okay, so as long as I can do this part, I'm completely done. Uh, all I need to show you is how to do this. And so I'm going to show you how to do this for two parties. You'll have to trust me that everything stands naturally for more parties. Okay, so here's two parties that have two different uh, public key secret key pairs, except uh, I'm cheating a little bit. They're going to use the same matrix B. You can think of that as some common parameter, like they're all using the same group uh, generator in, 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 in an elliptic curve group or something like that of that as an analog. Okay, so they're using the same matrix B, but they're choosing the, the actual public key and the secret key independently. Okay, and so now party one has some encryption of a bit X that looks like this. And in addition, it's going to create some helper information that will allow us to do this expansion step. I'll tell you what that is in a little bit in the next slide. But uh, remember, this is the main equation that holds for the ciphertext. This is, this is what it means to have a good encryption of X. But now let's see, let's try to do something odd and try to decrypt the ciphertext with parties to secret key. So that shouldn't work, right? You shouldn't be able to take a ciphertext generated by party one and decrypt it with a secret key of a different party. That, that would be bad. Uh, but actually, something interesting happens. You can sort of follow the math. You get the right thing except that you get an additional factor over here, which depends on the two public keys of parties one and two and the randomness R that was used to create this encryption. So you get the right value you want plus some blinding factor over here. Okay, and so this will allow us uh, to create 
an expanded ciphertext, he had, which just looks like this. I'm gonna put C in the diagonal and a matrix D over on the top uh, right here, where I'm gonna call D an unmasked term and it'll satisfy this property. T1D exactly cancels out this blinding, this, this mask term over here. And if I do that, then the right equation holds. So this ciphertext C encrypts the same bit under the expanded secret key. So on the left-hand side, you just get T1 times C, which is X1 TG. On the right-hand side, you get the combination of this term and this term. Maybe there should be a minus, probably a minus sign over here. Okay. So um, that's great. Everything works out. I still haven't told you how to, what this helper info is and how to create this matrix D. Those are the two things I have to tell you. So just uh, to, again, to just recall what our goal is now, I have to tell you how party one can create some helper information that will later allow us to create this matrix D satisfying this property. And you might think, why can't the helper information just be this matrix D? That would be the easiest thing, right? Because party one has T1, so it can actually create the matrix D to do that. Well, the problem is party one doesn't know B2. It doesn't know the public, party two isn't even around yet. There's, party one doesn't know anything about party two. They're totally uncoordinated, right? So you have to do, you have to create this helper information universally, but then able, be able to expand the ciphertext of party one to be uh, a multi-key ciphertext for any other party two that comes along. And here's the idea. The helper information is just going to be another GSW encryption of each bit of the randomness R used to create this matrix C. Okay, so we're just gonna just create a bunch of GSW encryptions of each component of this, of this matrix R. Now that's okay, I'm just uh, encrypting some data and then I'm encrypting the randomness used to encrypt that data, that doesn't hurt security. Okay, it satisfies this property. Later on, when I get the, when, I, when party two comes along and I do have the public key of party two, I'm gonna take all of these ciphertexts and homomorphically combine them to get essentially a ciphertext D which encrypts B2 minus B1 times R. Now, this is not exactly the same as GSW homomorphic computation. This ciphertext D sort of encrypts a vector, whereas these ciphertexts, uh, the GSW ciphertext encrypt just bits, but essentially using the same operations as the homomorphic computation in GSW, I can do this. It allows me to do this, uh, this part. So that's really the main idea, and now everything works out. So now once I have this matrix D, I can expand the ciphertext of party one to be a multi-key ciphertext for parties one and two. So that's the multi-key FHE. This, this, this is enough to do multi-key operations. The one last thing I want to tell you is how do you actually decrypt the ciphertext, the ciphertext you get at the end in a distributed manner. So remember, at the end, we have some expanded secret key T hat. That's just a concatenation of the secret keys of all the parties. We have an expanded ciphertext C hat that satisfies this equation. And we want to somehow decrypt it in a dist So if I had T hat in full, I could just multiply and recover X. But we, we want to do this computation in some sort of a distributed way where I only learn X and nothing else. And you could see that even if we could multiply T hat times C hat in a distributed way, that wouldn't be good enough because you, you would learn all of XTG. If X is one, that means you learn the secret key of all the parties, right? So we don't actually want to do this computation. We just want to get X. So the first step is going to be a step that I'll call sanitization step, step where we take the ciphertext C hat but somehow uh, shrink it down to sanitize ciphertext that I'll call little c hat by just taking g inverse of w, where w is this vector, just all zeros and q over two at the end. What happens? Now if you take t hat inner product c hat, little c hat, you get this value. Now, the, so t times c is x t g, g and g inverse cancel out, so you get x times t w, this vector, uh, so W has just zeros and Q over two at the last. Also, each one of these T's has a one as the last component. So you just get X times Q over two, something close to that, plus noise. Okay, but the nice thing is that now T hat dropped out of the equation. So it's safe to compute the inner product of T hat times C hat. It wasn't safe to do that before. So now what do we wanna do? We have the ciphertext C hat that just consists of N components. And we want to do the inner product with t hat. Well, that's just the sum of t i c i. Should be the subscript, right? So this gives us a really natural distributed decryption procedure where each party i just computes the inner product of its secret key and its component of this expanded ciphertext. 
and then we add them up and round. For security, each party is actually going to add some extra noise to this. And uh, this will ensure that actually the amount, this uh, value PI, this partial decryption that party I is uh, releasing, doesn't reveal too much about the secret key. In fact, you'll be able to simulate PI just given the output, the value that's encrypted in the ciphertext, if you knew the secret keys of all the other parties. So if all the other parties were malicious, your partial decryption doesn't reveal anything else beyond the output. It's not exactly clear if that's enough to do multi-party computation, if that's a strong enough secure notion. Turns out that this is good enough to do MPC with a little more work. You have to do some additional tricks to, to, to uh, be able to use this security property to actually do secure multi-party computation. Okay, so uh, that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to tell you, so let me just conclude. Um, so we show how to do multi-key fully homomorphic encryption. We get uh, with, uh, with a nice distributed decryption procedure. This lets us do two-round multi-party computation from LWE. And uh, several open problems remain. So one open problem is to uh, remove the public parameters in the multi-key FHE constructions. So right now we need to rely on some common randomness. We'd like to remove that. This would also mean that we would be able to remove the common reference string in our semi-honest two-round MPC. For malicious security, you need common reference string. For semi-honest, you might not need it. We have it, but hopefully, you know, if you solve this problem, you can remove it. Uh, we'd like to improve the efficiency. So right now, when you expand the ciphertext, every all the dimensions blow up by a factor of number of parties, and so all the operations are now more more costly, and doesn't that doesn't seem inherent? So uh, that's a good open question. question. And uh, last open question is: Can you do non-compact multi-key FHE from simpler assumption like DDH? You might think that multi-key FHE is more complicated than FHE which is true, but FHE is trivial if you don't require compactness, if you don't require the ciphertext to be small. Whereas multi-key FHE is actually still interesting, and if you think about the application to multi-party computation, we didn't really need compactness to do it. Even if you didn't have compactness, you get a multi-party computation protocol. So um, maybe you can do this from simpler assumption. Maybe you don't really need learning with, or other assumptions. Maybe you don't really need learning with errors. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Can you elaborate a little bit more on what extra stuff you have to do to get MPC at the yeah. end? Yeah. Um, so it turns out you get MPC, you, you, without doing any extra stuff, you get a multi-party computation protocol, which is secure where all but one parties are corrupted. So just one party is honest and everyone else is corrupted. It turns out this doesn't, that's not necessarily the strongest notion. It doesn't give you security when like two parties are honest and n minus two are corrupted. And um, so we showed that there's actually a fairly generic transformation that lets you take a protocol that handles all but one corrupted parties and lets you use it on, you have to sort of change the function you're computing it on, but you can use a protocol that handles all but one corrupted parties to handle any number of corrupted parties. And that's a fairly generic transformation. And it, that's because you've got two corrupted parties, let's say, then, then you don't know how they're, um, Oh, it's because you, if, if, okay. Yeah, so I can if simulate. There's only one, oh, if there's only one honest guy, then the difference, the, 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 you, know, you know what he's going to say, you can simulate what he's going to say. But if there's two honest parties, then you, you don't, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah so I, if there's one honest party, I can know what its uh, partial decryption is going to be. But if there are two, I know there's some, but I don't know which one is, I, I, I don't know what they are individually. So I don't know how to simulate two, cor two honest parties and every, all but two corrupted. I can simulate all but one corrupted, but I don't know how to simulate all but two. No, it's a, yeah, it's a general transformation. No more questions? Okay, let's uh, thank the speakers again and conclude for the day.